Okay, I think all our keynote speaker are here. Uh, so, uh, first, uh, uh, warm welcome to all uh, to our uh, architecture that is the future online lecture series. Uh, the topic today is the frontier of intelligent timber construction, and uh, first, uh, uh, I am Chai Hua and a uh, postdoc researcher at uh, College of Architecture and Urban Planning of Tongji University. And um, uh, uh, I will be hosting this uh, uh, forum today. Uh, so uh, the topic is uh, timber construction. Actually, this year's with the repeat advancements of digital design and robotic construction, uh, uh, the, the advance of the technology have uh, uh, continuously uh, uh, promote the uh, uh, the development of a timber structure. So this forum aims to discuss the uh, uh, application of intelligent technologies in the design and the, also the, the construction aspect of a timber structure and also how the emerging technology could uh, empowered the traditional uh, timber industry and also uh, maybe enhance the, our uh, construction efe efficiency and also accuracy. So today we have uh, three uh, very talented scholars who will share their uh, uh, latest research funding and maybe also uh, some practical experiences. Uh, they come from very different research background, but uh, each of them uh, possess profound research and uh, extensive experience in timber structure. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, five panelists, uh, all, uh, experts from very, also very uh, different background who is ready to dive into our competition after the three uh, keynote lectures. So uh, the event today will be divided into two sections. First, we will invite uh, our three keynote speakers to give our uh, uh, presentations, uh, each maybe each for uh, 20 to 30 minutes. And uh, following the presentation, we will have a, a opportunity to uh, have have a very free and uh, uh, open roundtable discussion for maybe thirty to forty minutes. And uh, uh, um, maybe first, I will uh, introduce our three keynote speakers. And uh, first, Doctor Xin Yan. Uh, who is an uh, architect with uh, the background of uh, mechanics and uh, computer science. He currently is a postdoc researcher at the Future Laboratory in Tsinghua University. And uh, his research uh, is uh, include the design-oriented architecture uh, topology optimization, intelligent fabrication, uh, digital uh, humanity, and uh, smart cities and uh, uh, the topic of his uh, his presentation today is uh, constructing uh, topologically optimized uh, special special structure using innovative uh, motifs and uh, tuner joints and uh, the second keynote speaker is uh, Dr. Li Jinghan who is currently an assistant professor at the College of Design Yunlin Yunlin University of Science and uh, Technology. His research interests uh, span from complex uh, uh, architectural geometry to automated construction, and uh, he will bring a presentation on augmented reality the design the fabrication of timber plate structures. And the third keynote speaker is Ms., uh, Mr. Uh, Mikola. Mi, mi, mi oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it, uh, You're almost there. Marashko. Marashko, sorry. 
Uh, thank you. And uh, he's the co-founder and the CEO of uh, Mistro, and uh, where he works on connecting sense, technology, and the design in the world of construction. And uh, he is trained as, as an architect at the U University of uh, Cambridge. And uh, he also uh, uh, draws from experience in timber carpentry and uh, training in computational design to celebrate the digital craftsmanship in construction. And uh, today, the topic of his presentation will be learning from the world around us. So uh, maybe let's uh, let's uh, start our lecture series and uh, welcome our first keynote speaker, Dr. Jin Yan. And uh, uh, Dr. Yan, are you ready? Yes, can you hear uh, me? Uh, yes, I, I was still okay. sharing. And, okay, thank you for the introduction. And let me share my screen. So, can you see it? Uh, not yet. Maybe. Oh, sorry, we, I need to make some exciting. So, um, oh, oh, sorry, I need to restart the uh, Zoom. Sorry, because uh, last time I, my, oh. my Zoom software is broke down. So, oh. sorry for that. So maybe, maybe we 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 can uh, change the the uh, order of the speakers. Is, is it okay? Okay. Um, I think the second speaker is uh, uh Doctor Li Jinghan. Uh, uh, could it be uh, the first one? Yeah. 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 Sure. Okay. Sorry for this. And uh, maybe let's welcome Doctor Li Jinghan to give us his presentation. Let me, let me share my screen. So. Okay. Uh, can you guys see my screen now? Oh. No. It, mm -hmm. it's something wrong with the uh, uh oh. okay and how about now uh, okay okay That's great. okay yeah okay uh, thank you for the introductions and uh, the invitations of this uh, uh forum and today's my topic is about uh, augmented reality aided design and fabrications of timber press structures and And now uh, I'm currently an uh, assistant professor in Yunlin uh, Technology of Science, University of Science and Technologies. And uh, my uh, main research focus is are about uh, integrative workflow of form findings and, and digital fabrications, including sheet dash material and the box orienting geometry. So, and uh, today I will. Uh, share two projects. Uh, one is the workshop uh, during this uh, summers uh, in Tongji, and uh, uh, the background of the, this project uh, is about uh, three uh, famous projects. One is about the uh, Buga Wood Pavilion uh, made by ICT, and is. Uh, constructed uh, by uh, with all fabricated uh, in six axis robotic fabrications and uh, it is uh, made of wood and metal. And then the second uh, related uh, build projects 
is emmed from EPFL invoice and it is fabricated in a 5-axis CNC machine and it is a purely wood and purely timber press structures. And the last one is uh, the work uh, designed and fabricated by Giddy Resins and is uh, uh, constructed in three axis CNC machine. And uh, you use augmented reality uh, to help them to uh, assemble it. And uh, the material is about wood and uh, the inner uh, metal fixings. So uh, in this project, we are trying to uh, combine all those three uh, ideas. And uh, the main uh, concept is from Curtin Pavilion, uh, which it, it, uh, is uh, tutored by uh, David Smith and uh, Andrew Smolik uh, in Australia, Perth. Uh, so it is an academic project in Curtin universities. And the students are encouraged to design structures uh, without any glue or mechanical fixings. And uh, the you can see the assembly sequence is uh, one directional order, uh, like a contour. So uh, you can uh, tell from the rationalization of this form and uh, the pattern of it. Uh, so uh, our uh, in this project, we are trying to focus on the double layer structures and the uh, pure wood uh, connections. And they, in, in another way, we try to use in augmented reality design and assembly and uh, with only three axis CNC uh, machines. So uh, combine all those uh, uh, um, premise. So it's about a joint best components and uh, also a, a discrete assemble units. So uh, the structure will be uh, easily reassembled without uh, harming each timber components. So the joint best components were, were made of uh, mortise, thinness, and some dose to increase the rigidity uh, of each uh, timber components. And uh, in the left chart, this is about the workflow that, that we study uh, about uh, uh, digital twins. So we will use the AR to increase uh, and the MR to increase the uh, data ex exchange. And uh, in the right, uh, for in the right pictures, uh, is about the workflow of the phone finding in this uh, workshops. So as you can see, uh, we can use some uh, manual adjustment to uh, manipulate the form. And those are the uh, uh, outcomes from the students. So, so finally, we took the, the last one in the bottom uh, pictures to, to build our project. So as you can see, uh, this is, you can use uh, gesture identifications and the form remapping uh, to adjust the, the pavilion in each step of form findings and also in each uh, iterations of form finding. And while the users are using MR to adjust uh, their pavilions, uh, there are also some information of structural analysis to display, uh, to be a feedback uh, of intuitive gestures. And furthermore, uh, we also add uh, fabrication constraints to the workflow in uh, MR, such as the relationship uh, between the thickness of timber press and uh, the dimension of finger joints. And, uh, in the uh, in the beginning of the workshop, we, we were plan to we plan to uh, try to use some uh, five or six axes. So you can see the uh, uh, the timber press is. Uh, the word finger joint could be uh, multi-directional, but uh, in the end, we only have the time to use uh, three axis machines. So uh, as you can see, it's, it's about uh, a 
constructed a, a rigid uh, timber box, and and also we use uh, we call uh, the biscuits uh, in the right of the pictures is the, the small uh, rigid components. The, to connect all the uh, rigid box and also to be the buffering zone uh, to kind of adjust the, the curve natures. And, and we also uh, separated into a different uh, assembly sequence. So as you can see uh, by using the uh, the, the MR or VR, we could uh, try to let the users to understand the sequence world, which components, assembling components they are uh, built. And we also use uh, uh, this visuals uh, assistance to uh, let the users to understand uh, which uh, units they are built. Okay. And those are the uh, pictures of uh, the assembly sequence. And uh, as, as we uh, talk, uh, mentioned before, that this project is designed to be uh, easily assembled. And so uh, as you can see in, in the left pictures, you can only uh, remove the, the doors uh, between or the basket between the uh, rigid components. So it could be assembled again easily. And this is the uh, 3D scan of our final pavilion. So uh, the challenge of the, uh, this project is uh, how to let the uh, kind of uh, the uh, the amateur users to uh, decide uh, under the help of uh, MR and also fabricate it with uh, simple CNC machines and uh, assemble it. So, and uh, the second project that I want to share with you is is, uh, is uh, Mountain Hut. Uh, this is a prototype design based on the typology of mountain huts above uh, 3,000 meters above sea level. And it focus on the morphology generation of a functional mountain house and also the, the, the uh, try to deal with the logistics of the construction. So we separate it into a different pieces or, or, or the component. So we decide to, uh, to design a module based component using C CLT to fit those purpose. The uh, on the top uh, left uh, is about the uh, prototype generations, and uh, in, in the bottom left is about the uh, uh, morphology generations. So we try to build the interface and then uh, using uh, MR to let the users understand the, the uh, situation for the, the final outcome that they design. So this slide, then, uh, this slide also demonstrates the prototype of single space, uh, just like a, a top left. Uh, and uh, the each one has some different functions like a living room or kitchens or bathrooms uh, for the mountain house. And uh, we, we designed like a 20 units. Uh, so in this kind of, we call micro scale, uh, those uh, 20 units uh, could be uh, connected together to establish the, the basic architectural elements uh, like wall or, or roof. And the, the logic of this, those uh, units uh, is to design a unique patterns for joint connections, uh, is, uh, is especially woodwork connections, and uh, also for the structures and the LED concerns. And uh, at the same time, uh, to also try to uh, display the beauty of Aboriginal and the vernacular cultures here. So as you can see, uh, you kind of some flowing pattern. 
and uh, because this is an uh, ongoing project, so uh, so so far we we only make some simple uh, fabrication prototype uh, using uh, plywood, and uh, so it still has a lot of work to do. But because we try to uh, solve the MEP and uh, the MEP concern and uh, the the uh, structural uh, strength of uh, the the elements. So, uh, so uh, we still have a lot to do uh, in this module design and the fabrications to actually to to make it uh, use could be useful practically. And uh, from left to right, uh, also we the 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 pattern of the unit is put also. Uh, to be a guide uh, uh, when we try to use uh, structural optimization. So especially in uh, topology, so the structural force for could be uh, our vector uh, directions guide. And so the uh, each unit uh, have different uh, directions to kind of uh, translate the force. So you will present uh, also uh, Ornamental and also functional uh, uh, performance. So, and uh, in the bottom, uh, this uh, the simulations of uh, uh, the world with opening and also some uh, rendering of these projects. Yeah. Okay. So this is a, uh, is my uh, presentation, and uh, thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the exciting presentation and the introduction of the two projects. And for me, myself, I'm quite uh, impressed by what you can do with AR in the uh, in not only the construction part of the uh, timber structures, but also uh, the form funding and the simulation process uh, of structures. And I think the audience and also our uh, panelists will have some more insights and questions for your lectures. But let's uh, leave that for the uh, panel discussion. And uh, now maybe let's uh, uh, come back to Dr. Yanxin. And uh, uh, could you test again? OK. S sorry for the delay. I think this time it works. So can you see the screen? Yeah, yes, but uh, we I, I didn't see your slides. Yeah. Uh, only your screen. You, you... This time? OK. It, OK. It's, uh, it's all good. OK. Now. So uh, thanks for the uh, introduction. And sorry for the delay. Uh, this night, I'd like to talk about topic about uh, constructing topological optimized uh, special stru structure using innovative mortise and tendon joints. So my name is Xin Yan from the Future Lab in Tsinghua University. And um, I have visited the uh, CISM, which is uh, led by Professor Mike Xie in MIT in 2019. And at that time, I learned the topological optimization and do some digital fabrication with the Professor Maxius team. And this project is achieved by uh, myself and Dr. Ding Wen Nikbao from MIT University and Chong Song Ren from the Beijing University of Civil Engineering and Architecture. Uh, also, uh, uh, this part is uh, guided by the uh, professor Yimin Maxia from RMIT University. So as we all know, there are increasing number of architectural applications with uh, the, uh, topology optimization methods from uh, building components like a uh, slide or columns to the whole uh, architectural form, such as a uh, Qatar National uh, Convention Center and so on. So actually, Professor Xi's team has also achieved several projects with Bissell topology optimization this year. Uh, also, thanks for the, uh, the, the support and the help from ADIF teams. Uh, we have uh, 
also do some projects in in Tongji University. Uh, th this project is uh, the first prize of the China uh, Aerospace Science and Industry Compo competition. Uh, in this competition, uh, uh, all the we 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 just uh, care so more about to achieve the best uh, structure of uh, performance with the least uh, material weights, uh, and each team's uh, design were printed by the three D printing techniques and uh, tested with the pressure machine. And finally, thanks to the visual method, we won the first prize. And uh, this pavilion is our first. Uh, Bezo Pavilion construction called X Form 1.0 in 2019 for the uh, Shanghai Tongji Digital Futures Exhibition. At that time, we used the large scale PETG plastic robotic printing technique to fabricate this optimal uh, structure and transfer them from Melbourne to Shanghai with ship. Later in 2019, for the IASIS exhibition, we designed another pavilion named the uh, X Form uh, 2.0 with the similar techniques, which is PETG material and printing and robotic fabrication. Uh, but the most different thing is that we divided it into several spe special components so we can take them only with a baggage from the uh, Melbourne to Barcelona. And in 2021, we also designed this uh, intelligent form for the uh, digital future exhibition using the uh, UHPC con concrete. In this project, project, the inner model was fabricated with robotic printing method. And therefore, as you can see, oh, sorry, sorry. Therefore, as you can see, uh, due to the complex features of topology optimization method, when common way to fabricate the form is additive manufacturing, which is 3D printing. And However, the robotic 3D printing techniques may bring some shortcomings, such as expensive, which means we have to buy one large robotic machines to print it, and the customized, uh, which means we have to fabricate many special components to assemble and unsustainable, because the printing material always comes to plastic, concrete, metal, which are not so friendly to our environment. So in this project, we just want to achieve an uh, optimized uh, pavilion which, with wooden timbers and uh, easy capital manufacturing, which also shares advantages of transportation and assemble them on time, on site. So fortunately, we might uh, inherit of intangible cultural inheritance called uh, Changqing Xie uh, in 2019, and he has many uh, computer experience in fabrication in fabricating uh, Chinese uh, traditional buildings. So when uh, motivation comes to us, which is if we combine the traditional mortise and tenon joints with the topology optimization, what will it be? Because the traditional mortise tenon joints can have uh, can share some advantages of uh, general and flexible stabilization and environmental friendly because it used the wooden material. And topology optimization can help us to gain the uh, lightweight structure with the highest, uh, maybe the high structural performance. And also we can generate uh, innovative forms. So after the discussion with uh, Chang Qingxie, we decide to start our design with three uh, common section types, which is re rectangular, ha uh, hexagon, and uh, octagon sections. Uh, for these three uh, section types, we can get the uh, facial angles uh, like uh, 60 degrees, uh, 90 degrees, 60 degrees, and uh, 45 degrees. So our 
pavilion design is based on the three above angles, and the uh, each component's modular need to be placed with the regular angle or and this is the top view of our start point where when we need to design the initial FEA model for the topology optimization, we decided the whole uh, structure with this three line. And then we get the top view. As you can see, the uh, the 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 blue columns comes to the octangle kimpos because they need to the uh uh fa facial angles about uh, forty five, and the orange one is the rectangle uh short columns, because it only needs uh six degrees and most of uh, the common parts are comes to the rectangle branches so we we also develop a, a crossover a, a algorithm to generate the all the things also we can uh, generate another uh, designs with four parts or five parts so this is the final view of our our pavilion, and because of the symmetric constraints, we can only only one over six parts is introduced with pressure or force on the top and fixed bottom boundary, also with a symmetrical constraints on the two sides. So, in the in this uh the polymerization method. We also need to divide it all the structure into several parts, uh, which mean uh, named the uh, uh, branch one to branch four, uh, which means these four colors uh rep represents four uh tree branches, and and with the help of our MV bezel, which means the multi volume. Uh, modified, modified uh, basal method. We each uh, subdomain can be equipped with its specific target volume to achieve uh, generating the timber members. So the left, uh, uh, the right uh, fingers comes to the uh, evolution process. As you can see, the material is removed one by uh, one step by one by step, and uh, finally we can generate a, a optimized result. Uh, which is looks like uh, some uh, uh, tree branches. And if uh, this is the, uh, and if we look at the final result, there will, there is still some problems in it. Uh, like some place, uh, so there are some two small members, also some two huge members, and some small intersection angles and some two complex joints uh joints so all of these are difficult to fabricate in for us so in the next step we just uh, change the uh topology optimized result to the initial beam model and we uh for the initial beam model, the relative position between two connecting members are changeable and required to be fixed within some several specific range because the mortise holes should be placed in some distance to avoid the structure broken. So the question is, what are the property relative positions for all the uh, branches or beams? beams? Uh, thus, we we just uh, made another model, uh, uh, which is composed of the beam X lines, and with uh, we develop a uh, mm, algorithm with four or uh, fourteen parameters to achieve the uh adjust the the the, the position between the, between the beams. So with the help of uh, Kremba FEA software and the genetic algorithm, 
we can address in all the 14 parameters to, ach uh, to achieve the more most optimized result. Also in this process, we introduced the uh, authentropic uh, material because the in, in real, the uh, wooden material is, is always the uh, authentropic material. So as you can see, the left one is the initial design and the right one is the optimized layout. Uh, in the initial design, the strain energy is 0.144 junior. And the last one is uh, about half of it, which means the, uh, the optimized uh, layout comes to the uh, higher structural performance. And if we look at the displacement, uh, if, if we look at the displacement analysis fingers, we find the biggest uh, displacement is the three top points of the short cones. Short cones. Uh, so we just add three horizontal beams to link them and also support the branch beams. So this is the final model of the our, our pavilion. And this model have a octangle section columns and the hectangle section columns, the short columns in the top. And others are rectangle uh, section timbers. So this is the all the all the members of our pavilion. So there are three types of uh, the mortise and the tendon joints here. Uh, the first one is uh, slave shoulder joints, and the second one is do uh, dovetail joints and the straight joints. So for the slip shoulder joints, we comes to the bottom, just, uh, we, we just need it to support all the pavilion. And the dovetail uh, joints comes to the main columns, which can, uh, the, the reason why we choose the this one is because uh, the do dovetail joints can resist uh, uh, not only the tension, but also, but also the compression force inside the structure. And the third one is the straight joints. This is a common or the most common joints in inside our structure, which can link the, uh, all the timber members easily. So we also, made a FEA simulation about all the uh, whole structure. At the same time, we also check all the components to make sure that everyone can uh, resist the forces in a safe range. So this is the manufacturing process. As you can see, due to our design, the clear shapes can even fabricate it by several students. They are from Beijing University of Civil Engineering and Architecture and have no computer experience before, but they can easily manufacture and dome under the surprise of a computer. So this is the total components of our design and uh, all the total weight is about 28 kilo, uh, kilogram, which can be packed packed in a big uh, box, baggage box, and transferred by Dr. Yu Li from uh, Shanghai to Melbourne with the airline. Uh, in Melbourne, we also assemble, uh, try to assemble the uh, pavilion on site with the phonogram, which is uh, a AR diverse uh, for us to make sure that the uh, wooden members are located in the right positions and uh, <clears throat> and this uh, help us uh, to re reduce the assemble time and this video showed the on-site assemble process we use about two hours to construct them with six students
and this is the final pavilion pictures. This pavilion is really convenient to be fabricated, transferred, and on-site assembled. Also, the wooden materials equips, equips the pavilion with advantages of cheap price, uh, environmental friendly, and the component more modularized. And at last, uh, our pavilion win the, the third prize in 2023 ISS uh, competition. So that's all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Xin Yan, for the presentation. And uh, actually, what interests me in this project uh, is uh, not only the uh, topology optimization technologies applied to the design of a timber structure, but uh, also uh, we, we see a lot of uh, culture aspect being involved in this research. We see how, how the team tried to reinterpret the traditional Chinese timber structure with uh, the uh, new technologies and uh, uh, resulting in the very exciting st structure design. Uh, so uh, also, uh, um, uh, thank you again for Dr. Yanxin. And uh, let's move on our third keynote. Uh, Mick, are you ready? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the invite. Maybe if we thank can you, stop sharing the screen on the previous oh, sorry. presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry. So each wonderful. Works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see the PowerPoint? Yes. Oh, Great. Good. Okay, so um, a little bit of background of what I do and what we're going to speak about today. Um, so much like I think most of the people on this call, I trained originally as, as an architect at Cambridge. And uh, these days I work with uh, Carlo Ratti, the, the, the MIT professor who, who leads the Sensible City Lab. Um, and I do kind of two things in life. The first is uh, I work as a designer at his, at his architecture firm, uh, advising on kind of digital fabrication matters. But more relevant to, to our conversation today is uh, for the last two years, we've been working on construction technology with Carlo and recently incorporated a, a startup uh, that focuses on kind of making the building process more, more efficient. And maybe a little bit unlike the, the first two presentations today, let's, let's talk for 15 minutes about more than just the design phase. So let's look at you know, some problems in construction and how we can tackle them, not just in, in, in design, but also in, in the way that we manufacture our components, in the way that we assemble them, um, and also in the way that we think about the materials which, which come into that process, right? Um, and I think as designers, we can really bring a lot to this process. And kind of the main thesis behind behind what I'm doing is this idea that construction is, is, is really far behind um, other industries in terms of adopting technology. Uh, in, the, in the academic world, you know, the, the, the previous two presentations are, are evidence to the fact that we are uh, kind of testing and uh, exploring new, new technology in a, in a strong way. But we're very bad at translating that into kind of practical uh, construction of square meters, right, in, in the world around us. And the hypothesis that we have is that to, to get that technology to translate into the way that we build uh, the environment around us, we need to learn from, from the manufacturing sector because the manufacturing sector has been able to quite well adapt uh, CNC manufacture, adapt other technologies to, uh, to the production of their components. So we can kind of learn, learn from there. And this is the, the subject for the talk. We will look at um, both some automotive and aerospace examples and how those can, can, can have insights for us as designers. Uh, and we'll also touch on three projects of, of, of mine that we're currently working on, both at the design stage, uh, in the kind of assembly phase, and uh, also some, some, some research that we did uh, this summer at, at Tongji with, with some students at the uh, Digital Futures Conference. So to kick off, just two slides that I think everyone um, is probably not, not surprised by. The first is that construction around the world 
is kind of set back by inertia. Uh, the, the funny statistic I like to quote is that in the US, if you look at the R&D spend as a percentage of revenue, construction is second last, the last being hunting. So construction in the US spends as much on research and development as hunting, but just a little bit more, which I think should be a red flag for everybody involved. And, you know, as a result, we get all the problems that we know about, uh, that um, emissions are uh, something like a quarter of the global total. We've got lots of waste and inefficiencies are, you know, everywhere. It, 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 it does not take a, a chart you can go to, to any construction site and, and look around and you, you will certainly notice that some things could be, could be done better in terms of speed, in terms of waste, in terms of material use. And in the end, it's, it, it, it's surprising because you look at, at this chart and looks at kind of uh, productivity per worker uh, or the value added per worker. And construction, in, at least in the States, and it's the same story in Europe, has been going down over the last uh, like 50 years, whereas the, the total economy has not. So clearly there's something wrong. And of course, this is on the surface a very bad thing, right? This results in the, in the emissions that, uh, that we looked at on the previous slide. But in some way, there is a silver lining. And that silver lining is in the fact that because construction generally is, is so far behind, we, can, we don't need to do hard science. We don't need to do something extremely novel to solve this issue, to bridge this gap. Instead, we should look to the world around us. We should look to, to the manufacturing sector. We should look to the technology sector and simply learn from what they're doing and integrate it into, into the construction process. So now let's look at kind of three potential ways in which we can, we can do this. Um, it, it really comes down to the, to, to the idea that I think in our lifetimes, construction is going to go from this complex process of assembling simple, simple material to a much more simple assembly process of more complex parts. And you know, that, 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 that process goes uh, through the manufacturing chain where the complexity of the parts gets captured in the CNC fabrication and not on the on-site work. And what's exciting for, for, for us speaking about timber is that timber is in some way very well positioned to be the first material category that, uh, that adapts this process. And we will see in a second why. Let's look at now kind of different phases of the project and different technologies that we can adapt from, from the manufacturing sector and, and, and adapt it for, for our purpose. And the first is kind of looking at, at digital twins. So as, as we all know, uh, BIM has transformed the way that commercial projects are, are done in architecture, right? Uh, Revit has a huge market share. It's basically the, the de facto tool. But BIM has, has a huge limitation in that simply coordinated design information is not quite enough to, to result in construction uh, efficiency. And that's to do with the fact that, that Revit as a, as, a, as a tool is in the end static, right? It, it, it talks about um, a coordinated set of information, but it doesn't follow the building process. And following the building process is something that the manufacturing world does very well. So if you look at automotive, um, they've been using digital twins for a while now to do uh, virtual vehicle testing, for example, right? And virtual, virtual vehicle testing simply means that now when an automotive company makes a, makes a new model, they do not have to make thousands of prototypes, but rather most of the component parts are tested and optimized for manufacture inside of the software environment. That's something very interesting to us as designers, right? Because Unlike automotive, each one of our buildings is unique. And so making physical prototypes of the building is, is, is nonsense. It, it, it is not uh, viable economically. So if we can arrive at a process whereby we can test uh, our designs in a digital twin environment, test them for uh, how to separate architecture into a set of components, uh, predict the, the production time of those components, uh, predict the speed of assembly by counting the number of assembly parts, right? Um, then we can suddenly start to, to crack part of that inefficiency puzzle. So in, 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 in a way, going from, from static BIM to digital twin is an important part of, 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 of cracking that code. And it's something that we're working uh, on at, at, at Maestro with building uh, APIs that plug into Revit to, to do exactly this kind of thing. Um, and of course, as, as, as the previous two speakers already pointed out, sort of CNC is really at the heart of, of making uh, this efficiency change possible. The exciting thing about CNC is that it's old in some way, right? CNC is maybe twice, uh, twice my lifetime in age, and that's great. 
because it means that it is no longer a niche technology. It means that in Europe, in the US, and also as we, as, as, as I know in China, um, the CNC network for different material categories is now vast, which means that construction companies, I mean, your, your, your run of the mill contractor making, uh, square meters of, of commercial real estate can tap into that network. And I think tapping into that network is something that is, um, extremely important, uh, for, for the industry in order to, to, to crack that efficiency puzzle. Um, now let's look at kind of a, a an early stage project of mine that tries to put together these things. So um, this is a, a building in, uh, in Northern Italy in, in a place called Monferrato. And it's a ruin of a, of a monastery. Um, the monastery burned down uh, in the 19th century and was kind of overgrown by, 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 by nature in the last uh, 200 years. And, you know, the traditional way to, to do this project was probably to, to, to demolish this, this heap of ruins, right? Um, and you might look at this and think, what, what, what does this have to do with digital fabrication? But the beauty of, of constructing things using digital twin and using CNC manufacture is that we don't need to demolish what is there. Um, we took a point cloud scan of, 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 of this ruin and uh, designed a CLT set of CLT volumes that go inside so that you can keep the heritage of the old monastery, but create kind of modern living environments within. So this is a project that uh, just completed the design development phase um, where we established a kind of construction strategy for inserting these CLT volumes into the point cloud. We're right now doing pre preparatory site work, pouring foundations. And now is the kind of phase of the, of the project where we can really uh, flex our muscle in terms of using tech to make this more efficient. So um, within our Revit environment, we are uh, optimizing the uh, cutting of these uh, CLT panels such that they're rapid to assemble and rapid to fix to the brick, uh, as well as easy to transport to this remote location uh, at a high altitude. Uh, at the same time, we're looking at the number of assembly steps that it would take to, to build something like this inside of a brick ruin. As you can imagine, it's not the, it's not the simplest construction to pull off. Um, but this is just to say that these maybe sometimes mundane technologies don't necessarily mean mundane results. Because thinking about uh, kind of what, what a car manufacturer does to get a Toyota off the production line it's very useful to us in some way to making sure that when we want to build bold projects, we think about uh, supply chain, we think about digital twin from the very beginning. And supply chain is really the next part of this, right? Because constructing a, a building like that requires putting together different components, uh, putting together CLT, putting together steel, um, and getting those manufactured is, uh, requires you know, a, a, a large chain of, of, of suppliers. And I think here the building industry really can learn a lot from, from aerospace. So the way that um, you know, a, a landing gear of an Airbus gets assembled is through real-time tracking of the, of the different components that are being put together. And this has really changed the, the efficiency at Airbus. And it's, and it's kind of part of the reason that they, they were able to leap ahead of Boeing at some point during during my lifetime, at least in the European market. And I think that this kind of idea of tracking components to our buildings and making sure that they arrive on time uh, and on schedule to our sites is something that's extremely, extremely important. Um, and here, you know, I, I, I can share these slides. We can go into more detail about the different parts of supply chain tracking. But uh, an interesting thing to look at is a, is a live project of ours. So this is a, a project in Miami. Uh, it's a, a, also an adaptive reuse building based in, on, on CLT. Uh, and let's just track the, the component parts here as they go through the, through the supply chain. So they're manufactured in Austria. They're tagged with, with QR codes that link back to our, to our BIM model. Um, they're then pre-mounted in, in Italy before being packaged. And then kind of the, 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 the next part of the, of the process starts, which is logistics, which is getting these things to, uh, to Miami. And again, we can learn from auto automotive in the way that they do, um, just in time deliveries. Uh, and we can imagine a, a future where on site, things arrive exactly at the, at the correct time to be rapidly mounted into the building. And it's exactly what we're doing with this project. So um, earlier in the autumn, uh, kind of this flat pack of components that is then going to be turned into, uh, into a small building arrived in, in Florida uh, on this beautiful flatbed truck. And here there is 
something that will take us back to the first slide of this presentation, which is that despite all of this um, technology involved in tracking components, involved in manufacturing them with the CNC, involved with having a LiDAR scan of the adjacent building and making sure that things are super um, precise, we still faced the, the problem, which is that we managed to manufacture this uh, prefabricated building in, in five months, but the people on site didn't quite manage to demolish the building next door uh, during that time. Which is quite amusing given that, um, you know, clearly there's something wrong. If we can manufacture something in Europe and pre-assemble it, dismantle, package, ship, and on site we are struggling to, to demolish, uh, it just shows the kind of different level of efficiency between manufactured construction and traditional construction. Okay, and let's just finish off on, 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 on a last project, which looks at more kind of upstream, which looks at material. And this is what, what, what we did at, uh, at Tongji this summer, looking at uh, kind of the way that CLT is actually manufactured. So the traditional means of manufacturing CLT takes tree trunks and makes from them lamellas, and those lamellas are rectilinear in, in shape. And as much as this is a economically efficient process, taking a tree trunk and cutting uh, rectilinear lamellas is, is cheap. Um, it doesn't take, take into account all of the tree, right? The, the natural shape of the tree is, is, is lost when you, when you cut rectilinear lamellas from, 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 from the trunk. So something we were looking at is uh, a degree of optimization around um, how, how one can take um, flat zone boards whereby they're not uh, rectilinearly cut. And optimize their sequence such that you minimize the amount of offcut uh, that you get. And, you know, this was the, the subject of the work um, during, during the summer with some students at, at, at Tongji. And the result is kind of looking at a new way of creating CLT panels to begin with, ones that follow the natural shape of the tree using AI automation, uh, using uh, LiDAR scanning of the, of the log to begin with. And I think that this can, again, help solve the uh, the sustainability puzzle that we are all looking at. So kind of to, 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 to wrap up, um, we think that manufacturing technologies that already exist um, are really the core key to making precise and efficient construction. And because the timber industry is already so embedded in the, in, in the CNC world, it's very well positioned to be, to be the pioneer in, uh, in getting this done. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, have you finished the presentation? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, I think we have uh, all of our keynote speakers uh, presented, presented. And uh, then maybe let's move on to our panel discussion. And uh, in our panel discussion, we also have several uh, researchers from different backgrounds who will join us in the conversation. And first, I want to give a very brief introduction to them. And first, we have uh, Alexander uh, Hatet Yao. I'm sorry, please correct me if I pronounce it wrong. Uh, He's a research assistant from MIT. And uh, is that Alexander here? No. OK. Uh, so uh, next uh, uh, guest is uh, Li Jiayi. Uh, who is uh, now a PhD candidate from Aarhus University. And uh, okay, I saw Jai here. And uh, next uh, uh, is uh, Li Yu, who is also my college colleague. And uh, he just uh, got his uh, 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 PhD doctoral degree from Tongji University who is also an expert in uh, topology uh, optimization. And uh, the last one is uh, Gao Tianyi, who is uh, also a PhD candidate from Tongji University. 
And uh, for this session, maybe we should uh, we we can uh elderly uh invite invite our uh guest researchers to share the insights and also maybe uh uh raise some questions that you want to talk with uh with the keynote speakers and uh, if Alexander is not here uh, maybe shall we start with uh Jia Yi. Okay. Hello okay. everyone. It's a... Okay. Oh, okay. Yours. Mm. Yes. Um thank you for your sharing from your uh, insightful presentation. And uh, I do have uh, eight questions for all three speakers. Uh may I ask you the first one to Professor Li? Yes. <clears throat> Uh, yes. I'm not sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed um, the detail. I'm very curious about the connection of your pavilion. So my question is: Does those um, cross finger joint uh, was uh, insert method or they glued together? Yeah, it, it basically is uh, finger finger joints uh, without okay. any glue. Yeah. So oh. uh, yeah. Yeah, then that is very good. And uh, does that uh, pavilion still be there, or is already disassembled? Uh, uh, I have shown in the kind of a last couple of uh, a slide that it is uh, already disassembled and uh, kind of delivered to another area to reassemble it again. But now oh. I don't know if it is assembled or reassembled. Uh, maybe we I see. I think our TA John is online, so maybe he, he can answer for, for us if if yeah, John? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so is, is the pavilion still uh, there? <laughs> yeah, I think the exhibition have been have uh, Come to an end, and uh, all the pavilion yeah. have been demolished. Yeah. Oh, then I'm very curious about um, during disassemble process. Is there uh, how you disassemble it by hand or by a robot, a robotic? Yeah, I, I think it, because uh, I'm not in in the uh, uh, campus when it, it is disassemble. So, but. Uh, I, I'm sure that it is uh, disassembled by uh, man manually hand oh. with some uh, jigsaw because uh, after after all, uh, all the structure be stable, some finger joint with some uh, doll would be kind of uh, stuck together. So yeah, yeah. we kind of have to cut off the biscuits or the dolls to, to remove the, the assembly. Yeah, but the, the finger joint part will be remain, so we don't so we don't really have to build from scratch. Oh, I see. Mm, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, yes, and um, yeah, uh, may I ask a, a question to uh, Doctor Yan? Yeah. Hello. 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 Yes. Um. I'm very curious. Uh, I want to ask uh, what kind of uh, plugins you use for Grasshopper uh, for optimization, and also uh, what software you use for the finite element analysis for your design. Yeah. Uh, for the topology optimization, I just uh, used the uh, uh, Python code developed by our team. Oh. Uh, yeah. So and, and for the next uh, the layout optimization, which means the uh ad ad adjusting the uh, fourteen parameters between the beam members, uh, we yes. just uh, use the Cramba, Cramba uh, plugin. Yeah, and also use the uh, genetic uh, component in Grasshopper. Oh, uh, genetic. This is the original components in Grasshopper, but sorry, I okay. can't spell it. It's, it's a, just a very special name. Oh, uh, it? 
<laughs> I'm not sure. Is uh, Kakala... it's, it's not... yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, I know yeah, which one yeah, it is. It's that one. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. and for the for the on-site example, uh, we just uh, use the hologram. Hologram. Hologram is another yeah is another software based on the Microsoft uh, and which is also developed by MIT University. So, uh, we just uh, try to use the hologram to 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 help us to assemble them on site. Yes, and uh, because I noticed that uh, you have um, a me mechanical engineering background, so I'm yeah. curious about your pavilion. Uh, did you ever did any um, mechanical test or analyze for the pavilion? You mean the physical uh, experiment yeah. or? Yes, a uh, physical experiment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> physical, we, we, we had not done it yet. Oh, yeah. yes, because you mentioned that you did some optimization for those uh, joint uh, between beams and the columns. And um, yeah. I think it's very interesting to have some um, uh, results to show that to show that uh, the mechanical performance, how it uh, optimized after your optimization device. Yes, so I'm, I'm just very curious about it. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, the last question to Mike. Uh, hi, Mike. And uh, wait a second. Uh, yes, uh, I very agree with you that uh, the designers hold very important role to um during the whole design process because the designers uh, need to considering the design from the manufacturer uh, manufacturing process and also uh, the structure side. And uh, my question is a. Uh, because the timber already have a very uh, already have a very good sustainable uh, ability performance, and uh, right now my research is uh, I'm very interested in the circular construction, uh, because for the concrete and the steel buildings, um, it seems like like uh, not that impossible to disassemble it and uh, reuse the those uh, element again. But the timber it seems possible. So considering about uh, disassemble problems how do you think we can improve the, the architecture design yeah i think that uh, kind of life after use and uh, design for disassembly are very important topics so i think if, if we rank steel concrete and timber steel usually comes out on top as something that is much easier to to, to, to dismantle reuse also uh, if, if need re-smelt into new timber timber sections right um I don't think it's it's fair to say that um, timber is, uh, is 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 so bad when it comes to uh, dis disassembly because in the end the question of disassembly is how do you construct the building is it a dry mount system based on bolts and screws or is it a um, a wet work like concrete pouring concrete that then dries and sets makes reinforced concrete something that is very hard to to disassemble and reuse, you know, like taking rebar out of a piece of reinforced concrete is, is nearly, uh, you know, in, in, in impossible to to think about kind of re recycling that. So I think timber construction, especially especially if you think about mass timber like glue lamb and CLT uh, buildings, are quite easy to to dismantle. At least what you know the structures that we design uh, with Carlo and uh, at Maestro are uh, made such that you know within a uh, hundred years you can quite easily imagine to take those CLT panels, unbolt them, and then either use them in another construction or use them in, in other uh, cases, such as you know furniture um, components uh, or something along those lines. So I think that timber as a, as, a, as a material is something that can have a, a longer lifespan than just one, one construction cycle. Yes. Um... Okay. Thank you for your uh, opinions. Uh, I do think so. The timber, um, except uh, except um, sorry, uh, for those uh, mass timber components, it's very easy to reuse again. And uh, but uh, for some designs, there are some uh, pav pav pavilions, and uh, they can they show up how they dissemble the pavilions. But those joints of uh, those uh, timber teams and the timber columns. Uh, 
it looks very giant. It cannot um maybe for some architecture side, it's a too obvious uh, to solve those uh, joint. Uh, how do you think that? Right? Like uh, for example, should should every project need to consider this assemble work in their design in their initial design, like um, easily for reuse again? Yeah, look, I think that in the end we have to ask ourselves a question that looks at the material that we use on a given project and looks at its useful lifespan. So if you are building a permanent residential block and you have a design expectancy of uh, close to 100 years, maybe achieving that design expectancy requires you to create joints and details that are more difficult to, do, to dismantle. And one can argue that's, that that is a totally reasonable thing to do. However, if we are looking at making a pavilion that is going to last you know, two weeks at a fair, um, then design for this, this assembly becomes almost an ethical imperative, right? So I think that it's something that we need to evaluate on the basis of the of the whole kind of asset life cycle. Um, and another thing to kind of to add here is that maybe instead of thinking about design for disassembly, let's think of design for, for future flexibility because yes. it's mo more likely than not that in 60 years, um, the buildings I built today will have to have a, a different and new function. So rather than thinking about just the fact that in 60 years it's possible to dismantle and go back to where we were two years ago, maybe we should think about creating structures that allow the user to partially modify. And here, again, dry mount systems based on mass timber are great because you want to add a, you know, a door opening and a CLT wall. Most of the time, that's a matter of doing some very simple static calculations and taking out the chainsaw and you know, making your opening. Um, and this kind of degree of flexibility, I think is just as important as thinking about disassembly. Yes. Uh, right now I'm doing some research about uh, modular timber buildings and uh, I'm based in Denmark and there are some modular timber co companies. Uh, they rent their timber models and uh, like uh, for school, uh, because, uh, for example, if the school is under construction and uh, during the summer, they don't have any place uh, to teach kids. And so they rent those uh, timber models, uh, used for uh, temporary classrooms for students. And uh, after maybe two or three months, they return those timber models back to the factory. And uh, mm -hmm. those companies can use these models again to another project. So it's a, I think it's a very... Um, uh, sustainability use uh, for timber buildings. And uh, for my project right now, I is, uh, I'm considering how to optimize those uh, timber models and uh, to achieve a uh, more uh, complex uh, architecture design. So I think it's a very um, interesting to to considering the, the more complex uh, disassemble problems at the beginning, yes. So that's why mm -hmm. I ask uh, those questions. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that sounds you. super exciting. Yeah. That sounds super exciting. Um, thank you. Um, yes. And I think that timber is actually really great for this, right? Because timber is light, uh, as as if if you think about kind of the the weight it can carry, the load it can carry per uh, self weight. Uh, we're actually thinking about something that's reasonably easy to transport. Um, so yeah. I think that's something that has some degree of promise. Uh, thank you for all your uh, answers, and uh, yes, and uh, also thank you for every participate, uh, every for uh, for everyone joining this meeting. And if you are interested with my research, welcome to contact me. Yes, thank you. Sure, thank you. Also, thank you for for the questions and for sharing your research topic. And uh, maybe let's continue our discussion. Uh, Dr. Yu, would you? Yeah, it's back. yeah, I'm here. Um, thanks, and Dr. Chai. Uh, yeah, I have um, two questions for Dr. Xinyan. And uh, Dr. Xinyan, thanks for your experience and the impressive presentation. So I think um, it's really amazing to combine the two technologies. One is the uh, topology optimization, and uh, the, uh, the other is the uh, traditional woodwork um, technology. So 
I want to know, um, is there any difficulties or problems you might and you have to solve during this project and to combine these uh, technologies together? So uh, would you please introduce some of your, of your experience during this project? Sure, sure. Thank you for your, your question. Uh, I think the biggest uh, difficult for me is uh, for, for the traditional multi-centered drawings, uh, there should be some uh, specific range between the two uh, drawings because if we just uh, dig a hole in, in this direction and dig another hole in this direction, these two holes are all inside in the one in the same member. So if they are placed uh, too close, the the material between them will be so weak, and the the the, the columns uh, are easy to be broken bro broken. So we need to adjust uh, the two holes uh, away in in a, in a specific distance. But in topology optimization, we it is hard for us to. Uh, pre-designed this specific distance between them in uh, before the uh, evolution process. So in this design, we just uh, use the topology optimization as the draft uh, generative tools. And then we, as you can see, we use the layout optimization using the crime bar to adjust the the uh, the the, the the parameters to make sure that the, the material between the two holes are enough to resist the force. Yeah. Yeah, you, you mean you have done some possible sizing to adjust the original form obtained from the topology optimization. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I, yeah thanks. Thanks for your yeah, answer. Yeah. Um, I have the second question that is. Uh, you know, as current, some research is focusing on robotic fabrication. So, like just uh, just like uh, doctor and uh, test research. And uh, so, uh, the two different uh, methods. One is the traditional uh, woodwork technology that you introduced today, and uh, the other is uh, robotic uh, fabrication for woodwork. And so. Uh, I want to ask what's your opinion towards the differences between the two different methods when they are used to fabricate the structures ob obtained from topology optimization? Thanks. Okay. So that, that's a really good question um, because um, as you can see, in this pavilion design, we just uh, uh, use uh, some limited uh, digital fabrication techniques because this is only the first step uh, for us to uh, for, for for our research because uh, our the, the the final uh object of our research is to combine the traditional uh, uh multi antenna joints with the digital fabrication, but there is a, a lot of uh, difficulties uh, we, we, we met. So um, I think these two techniques can be combined in the future, and uh, but there are still some difficulties because uh, in, in the traditional drawings, we can see there are some uh, very special and uh, uh, special shapes inside of, you know we need to dig the hoses inside the wooden members which is uh, really difficult for the machine to uh, go inside the timber and uh, and do some special things things uh, inside inside the wooden members so i think the most uh, difficulty for this is how we can develop the Machine hands like 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 the traditional temperature to can use you use his hands to to do the very small things. So I think it, it, that that's all. 
Yeah, thanks for your answer. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, that's my all of my questions. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Dr. Li, and uh, we'll have another uh, guest, uh, Mr. Gao Tianyi. Uh, he is also a church candidate here, and uh, he is uh, also uh, 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 like a uh, uh, master in uh, robotic fabrication in timber structures, and uh, he has uh, managed to build a very exciting structure this summer in the in our digital future uh, workshop, and uh, uh, I believe he he can he will also have some insight about the. Uh, New technology in timber structure. Okay. Uh, so, go. So, okay, so thank you all for your fascinating presentation on intelligent timber construction. So, first, I want to raise a question for Dr. Yanqing. And since we understand the application of topological optimization in timber structure, is indeed and it's, it's, it's indeed very innovative. But I'm curious about how can we address the challenges of considering the anisotropic nature of the move during the optimization process? And um, additionally, since my research focused on the intelligent design and construction of laminated timber, so I'm wondering if this optimization approach is equally applicable to the engineering laminated timber as well, especially when we are dealing with some large scale components with is complex vortex and panel joints. So thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, actually, the the current uh topology optimization uh have uh, limited functions in deal with the uh real wooden materials, but there are so many researchers are uh, 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 do the research about it. So if you if you need to carry about the uh oxo or tropic uh, properties of the wooden material, we need to change the 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 theory of the Bissell method. So as you can see in in our design, we just uh, use uh, introduce the uh. Also, tropic materials in the uh, topology optimization process, but we because you know, for for us the topology optimization is uh, only it is just uh, the uh, tools to generate a draft a uh, 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 very uh, initial design, and then we transfer the initial design to the layout optimization. Uh, because Kramba can uh, help us to calculate the oxytropic um, wooden properties. So we can make a more accurate calculation with the Kramba. And then we can also analysis, uh, do a finish uh, accurate analysis uh, uh, based on the uh, Abacus software to, to do the simulation about all the Joints and the uh, whole structure. So for your question, the the topo the polo topology optimization is uh is still not e uh enough to 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 uh, solve the problem about the real wooden materials. Yeah, and and about the application in the in the CLT or GLT, so it is really applicable in this in the real engineering projects. Uh, yeah, the CLT is another very uh, complex pro uh, material because it has wooden and it has glue. Maybe maybe yeah. some glue inside be between the wooden. So, uh, if we if if you need to a uh, very accurate solution for it, maybe we need to do a material experiment of the CRT and uh, get more data about uh in in, in each direction, 
maybe there are many data in different directions. Uh, I mean, the material properties. And then we need to uh, modify a very complex uh, topological mechanism method to, 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 to solve the, the, the things. But if you just uh, want to do uh, uh, achieve a very not, not, not so accurate solution, you can just uh, do a very um, image. I mean, I mean, you can yeah. simplify it into some yeah. normal materials. Yeah. Yes, I understand. It depends on yeah. which state you are in in the design, in the whole design process, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thanks for your reply. And now I think it is really necessary for the scholars to develop a software. Uh, I mean, to optimize the timber structure since we already have the you know the technology for for complex timber geometry fabrication, and this can also help designers to find and uh, to to find their preconceived notion of timber construction and encourage and encourage them to rethink the design process for timber structure. And we are really we are all looking forward to see your further research. And the next question is for uh, Dr. Qing Han. And since your research on AI augmented construction is particularly promising, especially for you know the complex and irregular components. And my question is, does this technology have some limitations in terms of the scale of the components being constructed? And specifically when we are dealing with also you know the large scale components that require multiple repeated positioning technology, could these errors potentially uh, affect the installation precision and efficiency? And do you find this effect are more easily solved by software algorithm or hardware system? Yeah, okay. thanks for your question. It's also, also a good question. So uh, as you can see, uh, one of our uh, background research is, uh, is from EPFL, Ebois. And uh, it is, uh, I mean, because uh, for our experience, uh, the workshop uh, project is a short time project. So, so indeed that the, the scale um, does matter. So in uh, in this kind of uh, Google connections or, or the discrete uh, components uh, with biscuit and dolls, it cannot support a large scale or a, 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 a long time use uh, uh, structures. Yeah, so I think uh, maybe for for the further research, we, we will focus kind of using uh, five axis or robotic uh, fabrications. So uh, so we can kind of uh, make the components larger without any basic or dolls, because it is uh, actually it's a buff, it's, it's a the kind of buffering zone, but it's also the weakness point of the whole structures. So as you can see, uh, we only kind of uh, simul simul uh, simulated the, the shell only, not for the whole uh, structures. I mean, the, fin the finger or the box, yeah, we didn't si simulate it in, in, in Karumba in, in, during the workshop. Yeah, so uh, maybe we, we can use, uh, as I know that the, the compass would be used to this kind of simulations. Uh, so maybe I, I think that the tool or the technology te technology will be uh, sufficient to deal with this kind of uh, scale problem and the efficiency problem. Yeah. So thank you for your response. And I think it is clear that pushing AI augmented construction into uh, mass customization production will still take some time, but it's really yeah. exciting to witness the whole development process. And I'm also looking yeah. forward to see some papers in the future. So let's yeah. give back time to Ms. Chai Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, we, we have uh, got a lot of questions for our speakers. Uh, maybe uh, I, for me myself, I also have some questions that I want to talk with the uh, speakers today. And uh, maybe uh, the continue of the question of Tian Yi Gao. And uh, 
I, I see some similarities in the research of uh, maybe Dr. D and uh, Dr. Yen, and you both use uh, AR technology in the construction of timber structure. And uh, actually, uh, as I know, the AR aided construction have uh, started maybe like uh, two decades ago. I, I don't know. It started from the uh, uh, use uh, the utilization of AR in the construction of uh, uh, brick lanes or something uh, like this. And uh, today. Uh, uh, we see some new uh, aspect of AR aided design, AR aided bone uh, funding uh, in the research of Dublin, and uh, I'm but I'm also quite uh, uh, curious of uh, uh, what's the future of uh, AR aided construction, and uh, maybe we let's pose the question more interesting. And uh, for maybe for you, if uh, 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 can, can you imagine uh, or what's your biggest, uh, your greatest uh, ambition in your research that you want to achieve uh, in the aspect of AR aided uh, timber construction? Uh, uh, did I make, make myself clear? Uh, like, uh, what's the future of uh, this? Kind of uh, technology in the in the industry, or uh, what uh, evolution it can make to uh, to to our uh, industry today. Yeah, uh, as for me, uh, actually, uh, I I'm kind of struggling in in the limitations of the uh, AR the fabrications or assembly because. Uh, the one one way is about the connectivities or the, the efficiency of the the uh, software or the devices. Uh, during our, our research, is, uh, we we kind of spend like uh, maybe fifteen percentage of time to solve the connection problems. So so that, that is uh, one limitation, and and the other limitation is about the information is. Is are quite neutral. Um, I, I mean, uh, sometimes I, when we want to uh, display some structural informations or some uh, haptic uh, touch uh, gestures uh, feedback, it is not so intuitive or so uh, or uh, so um, kind of meaningful. Or, or, or can do some really impact to our design procedures. So, so for me, if if we can solve those two problems, I I think AR aided uh, design fabrications would be uh, would be a a, a, a good uh, methods to continue it. Yeah. So this is uh, so far my my understandings or my experience about it. Sure. Uh, I also uh, quite interested in what uh, uh, maybe I'm grateful to make who who bring the industry aspect of the timber construction into our conversation, and maybe uh, I, in the presentation of Mick, I noticed that you are uh, both uh, uh, based on uh, the research aspect and also the uh, practice aspect. You have a a, a company. Uh, it it is a, a about the timber construction or it's a technology company. So at this point, we are a, a technology enabled builder. So we are a general contractor, and uh, a lot um, of what we build is with CLT. So it's with with timber based products, but we're also working a lot with steel, uh, mm -hmm. looking to. We're, we're laser cutting steel components and, and welding them together in new ways to create these uh, rigid decks. Um, so as much as our interest is, is is definitely kind of aligned in that we're all looking to make design and construction kind of speak more of the same language. I think the, the, the work I'm doing is more kind of in the, in the in the commercial or industrial sense. Maybe something just interesting to add is about AR in in assembly. 
um, something interesting that we we have been testing is um, we have some friends that work at uh, the Volkswagen Group, the the automotive manufacturer, and during COVID, they started giving the repair workers the repair workers for 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 Volkswagen cars. Uh, they started giving them AR goggles, and the idea was that the assembly crew, when they encounter a problem they don't understand they have the engineer start looking through the camera in the AR goggles and the engineer draws live the instructions for them how to resolve it and you know it's something that's very simple right it it it, it requires maybe a little less technology than what uh, kind of we were discussing today but it could be something that in the very short term can be a great tool on sites, right? Because the, the problem I have often is we ship these components to different sites across the world, and then assembly workers, you know, have have some trouble maybe understanding instructions. If I could see through their eyes and give them instructions straight away, you know, it can be a, a great tool um, to 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 speed up the process. So maybe this is one of the one of the kind of short term uh, applications of the of the tech. Yeah, I think we have already. Uh, we can already see the greatest potential of AR in the in what what you call the short term vision, and also I I think in your research we can also uh, notice that you uh, mentioned a lot about uh, using the e existing CNC technology or the existing process that have already been uh, established in the industry, and. Uh, uh, then try to revolute uh, the some some of yeah. the some of the process, but uh, actually I have a question. Today we uh, we can uh, see uh, some new research about AR about uh, the uh, topology optimization design, and also uh, see your research about the uh, upstream uh, uh, innovation in material production. And how do you come by the uh, new innovations like uh, robotic fabrications and AR aided uh, fabrications to the ex uh, to your uh, practice of uh, uh, the existing uh, yeah. process? Okay. I see. I see the question. I get it a lot. Uh, so I think first, maybe let's just roll back a little bit to try to explain the reasoning behind this focus on the existing network, right? On the existing network of CNC fabrication. Mm -hmm. I think that construction is something that is so complex that if we start from a blank slate, right? If we start from complete, completely from nothing and try to build everything ourselves in terms of new, new technology, we will not get very far. Even with a lot of funding, we will not get very far, right? A great example is Caterra, the, the SoftBank funded company in Silicon Valley. They, they try to build out their own factories with the greatest six axis CNC to cut components. You know, it, they, they got something like two billion in investment and they burned through it in two years, which I think is the fastest time period that any industrial company has burned through that, that money, right? So instead, we need to be a bit more humble, I think, in, in, in the way that we approach construction. It's something that people have been doing for centuries. It's something that also the, the manufacturing world has been doing digital fabrication for, for decades. So let's go to them and let's start by using what we already have and adapting it for our, our needs, right? So this is kind of step one. Then step two is let's now look upstream. Let's look towards materials and how we can make those more efficient, the materials that we then fabricate. And then step three is let's understand how we can combine all of this process and then use other technology to help us assemble these things in a more efficient manner, right? So uh, to, to answer your question about how how does new research feed into what we're doing, I think it's about um, it's about looking at really the the thing before and the thing after the the network of existing CNC manufacturers. So either it's about looking into materials like we're doing with 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 AI timber with with with, with new kinds of CLT. We're also looking at making CLT from other species of timber, looking at making CLT with eucalyptus, which is much better at, at sequestering carbon, and then using the existing network to, to manufacture that. Or we're looking at the very, very end. So thinking about some of the things uh, like AR that uh, Professor Lee was, was was talking about at the beginning. Great. And uh, thank you for your uh, inspiring uh, answer. And uh, I think... Uh... Any more questions or any thoughts we want to share from the panelists or from the keynote speakers? 
I think there is a question in the chat from Kim. Uh, 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 maybe I'll read it. Hello, everyone. I want to express my appreciation for the insightful and the thought-provoking presentation. This is Kim, and I have a question for Dr. Yanxin. In your presentation, you showed several remarkable topology optimization projects involving concrete, plastic, and wood. Uh, could you please highlight the main difference or challenge between uh, topo uh, top topology optimization for wood as uh, uh, compared to the other materials? Dr. Yanxin. Yeah. Thank, thanks for the question. I think the most uh, difference is about because for, for the plastic or and concrete and uh, metal, they are all the uh, isotropic material, which means uh, they have the same material properties in all directions. But for wooden, especially the uh, raw wooden, it depends on which part you you cut it from the chunk. If you if you cut the part the, the, the material from the center, it has a uh, uh, it has one properties in 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 the three direction. Uh, they, they, they have different uh, properties. And if you cut the uh, material from the boundary, it also have uh, another three uh, material properties. So I think uh, the first one, the first uh, difficulty is we we should we need to ident identify what the uh, wooden material cut from, and the the second question is uh, the current uh, classical topology optimization cannot deal with the 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 the. Uh, uh, anti isotropic materials. So we need to modify the um, basic theory, theory behind the Bezo method. And then we can calculate and optimize the wooden material in a structural optimization. So there are too many um, difficult for us. And I also want to share some my my uh, views uh, uh, to the last question from Dr. Chai Hua. Uh, in my view, the the A AR maybe the in the future the AR can be equipped with some analysis functions because when we use A AR uh, diverse now, uh, we only input the uh, very solid model inside it and we can see it in front of our eyes on site, but the model cannot be changed. And uh, uh especially in real time because when we when we uh, assemble the pavilion, maybe it will be falling down a little bit a uh, distance, but this uh, uh form change cannot be analysed by uh, in real time by the AR divers. So if if we can add the analysis uh, analysis uh, function inside it, maybe it will help more students and more researchers to to finish and achieve the on-site example. Thank you. Great, great, thank you. And uh, I noticed that uh, Alexander will ha uh, have already joined us, who is already uh, uh, panelist of our uh, today's uh, discussion. Uh, Alex, are you here? I'm here. I, yes. Uh, I think maybe you, you have missed uh, a lot of very exciting presentations. And uh, I, I don't know how to do <laughs> Have any insight or questions you want to raise? Yeah, I can. I guess I can oh, go up. This is... Yeah. No, no. I'll just say hi to everyone. Thank yeah, you. hi everyone. Uh, I'm Alex. Oh, uh, I, I guess I can go off what uh, 
Yanshin said about AR, uh, I think there are projects out there right now where you can do like real time interactions with like geometries you're changing uh, on site and then like have a more collaborative uh, outlook. So I feel like I, I could definitely think it would be interesting to see how glue lamp fabrication kind of joint comes together with that because there's a lot of errors that could come about and I guess ways to manage this error in a more interactive and feedback-based um, processes would be a very interesting research project to see. Okay, uh, maybe today you have uh, missed a lot. Maybe next time you can uh, join us again and share your insights. Sure, okay, yes. uh, sure. A any other questions from the audience? Uh, actually, our uh, lecture series is uh, 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 also live stream on WeChat and also really, really uh, uh, video uh, platform in China. And uh, I think uh, uh, maybe maybe the the most of the audience couldn't uh, interact uh, interact with us. Uh, we we have a follow up uh, question for also uh, it's from Mick from also from uh, him and uh, for Doctor Mick thank you for your insights from a designer to towards the uh, the manufacturing industry and the CLT construction I'm interested in hearing your perspective on CLT. Uh, cut out special uh, uh, sorry. Uh, specifically those for windows and the doors in your current project. Have you taken into consideration any potential side effect of CNC cutting? And what is your opinion on the high value byproduct that may result from this process? Uh, do you have any suggestion to use uh, those materials? And Mick? Is are you still here? I think it's uh leave maybe for uh for a moment. Uh any others uh, want to share your opinion on this these questions? Um, hello, I can share hey. something. Yeah. Uh, so um, in in past half year, uh, we did a questionnaire based on the wooden waste uh, for manufacturer site, and uh, we are very curious about. Uh, uh, how much waste material they produced and uh, how they handle those waste. So I think uh, this questionnaire is uh, highly relevant uh, to uh, this question. And uh, there are two sides uh, for, from uh, CLT producers. Uh, they said they, uh, from their feedback, they said they don't have uh, too much waste. And uh, for those uh, materials uh, cut off uh, from uh, CLT elements, they reuse it, not reuse it. They put it, they give it to the uh, following manufacturing uh, companies. They use it for, for burn it for some energy. And uh, maybe they cut it into, um, uh, to make some chip board and uh, plastic board instead of um, engineer uh, timber elements. Uh, but we are very curious uh, how we can use with a set, uh, with a cut off of CLT materials because the uh, mechanical performance of uh, those uh, CLT elements is uh, definitely very strong and uh, good enough uh, to rebuild something. And uh, yes, I just want to uh, say my opinion. It is a very interesting topic. And thank you. And uh... Actually, uh, if you uh, have any publication or uh, you could share some way about your questionnaire, the results of your questionnaire will be uh, great to uh, get an insight about this. Is this part of this 
fabric production. Actually, in the uh, project uh, of uh, me, this summer, we can also see some uh, 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 efforts uh, put into the up upstream uh, material production process that uh, uh, want to uh, reduce the waste uh, from the very beginning of the uh, uh, timber pro uh, harvesting and to the uh, production of a timber element. And uh, uh, next week, we will also have a, a forum uh, the, sec the second forum on the same topic, which will more about the, the fabrication aspect of the timber structure. And uh, we will have uh, 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 an an another uh, panel of uh, uh, experts who is, uh, 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 who, who is interested or have uh, uh, some uh, insight uh, about the fabrication process uh, of a timber structure. Maybe you, uh, 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 you are welcome to uh, stay tuned about our activities. And uh, I, I will also be part of the ac activities uh, next week and share our research about the robotic timber construction. And uh, you are all welcome to come back and. Uh, uh, have a talk again, and I think the time is already uh, there. And uh, if we don't have any question, more questions, uh, let's uh, maybe call it a day. And uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you all for your inspiring insights on the questions about the timber intelligent timber construction. And I hope to see you next week. And maybe bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you again.